Good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I guess for, for some, it's good morning. Um, this is John Bingham, president of Bingham Flexo Services. Uh, coming from my, my home office where I've been quarantined for a couple months now, not quarantined, but uh, been working out of here for a couple months. For those of you who are not, uh, not familiar with Bingham Flexo Services, we're a manufacturer's rep company uh, located in Batavia, Illinois. We actually office right in Pamarco's manufacturing facility here in the Midwest. Uh, we've represented uh, Pamarco for 22 years now. Uh, some of the other companies that we work with as their representatives are companies like Uteco and Graphic Control and Gray Mills, um, Gamma System and so forth. But I, uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to do a, a fairly short presentation similar to what I have done over the years uh, at Fox Valley Technical College. I've removed some items, I've added some items. We recently did a uh, abandoned analogs test that I think is quite interesting. So I'm going to uh, discuss that as well. As we go along, if you have any questions, please uh, write them down. And at the end, I will uh, uh, read them and answer them. Let's see here as I go along. So the, the title of uh, title of my um, presentation, oh, here we go, is uh, analog selection and management. And, uh, you know, I refer to the analogs role as the, the heart of the flexographic printing press, because the reason why is it's the primary component within the printing press that determines the ink film thickness that's going to transfer to the substrate, which has a huge impact on the quality of the graphics being printed. Um, flexographic printing is, is, a, is a process which has a lot of components and variables, not only the, the analogs role, but the doctor blade or the metering system is extremely important to, to make sure that the ink is completely metered off the cells of the analogs roll and just the volume of ink inside the cells is transferred to the printing plate. The ink is kind of known as the blood of the process. You know, it's the part that uh, flows to the plates and the substrates and determines the color. The plates, many people refer to those as the brains uh, because it determines, you know, the area on the, on the uh, substrate that's gonna be printed. And then obviously we have the sticky back, we have substrate, we have impression, uh, both, both analogs to plate impression and plate to substrate impression. And the most important of all these are the press operators. Right, so one if you if all these elements aren't um, correct, we can have you know major problems. So all all of these variables and components need to work in sync with one another. Um, as again, as I said, the analogs role is the heart of the process process or heart of the printing press. It is engraved by with a laser beam and engraved with millions of tiny little microscopic cells that are are meant to be exactly identical to one another. Um, we, uh, we uh, um, when we engrave these cells, we measure everything in microns. So the average, like on a, on a, say a 300 line screen, which is a fairly coarse engraving, the average width of the cells is about 75 microns. The average depth of the cells are gonna be about a third of that or about 25 microns. Um, so it's really a very minute, precise, precision instrument. A little bit about the manufacturing process, whether it be a new analox or a reworked analox or sleeve. What we do is we start with the base, the base core, whether it be a steel base or an aluminum sleeve, and we use a plasma spray process to apply a nickel alloy corrosion barrier. And that nickel alloy corrosion barrier is meant is, is is put on the surface or on the on top of the aluminum or steel to pre prevent the, uh, um, the water-based inks and coatings, high pH cleaners, from penetrating through the ceramic and attacking that that steel or aluminum base. That's only applied about five thousandths thick, so it's a, it's kind of an eggshell coating. It's a, it's thin, but it's very dense. After that, we utilize the same equipment or similar equipment, plasma spray equipment, to apply what's called chromium oxide. Chromium oxide is the ceramic that's utilized by the analogs industry. 
We typically will apply that somewhere between five and ten thousandths thick, really depending upon the the depth of the engraving that's that's going to be engraved into the surface of the roller. After we apply this, the chromium oxide ceramic, we then on the top right um, bring it over to a diamond grinding wheel. The, the job or the, the job of the diamond grinding wheel is to grind that surface so it's a, it's 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 at an exact diameter and very concentric, so it's not out of round. You don't want your your analogs to be egg shaped, otherwise it will hit and miss the printing plate. Um, you know, as it transfers ink from the from the surface to the printing plate. After that, bottom left is a picture of one of our, our stone polishers. We use a series of diamond embedded stone polishers, uh, coarse to medium to fine, to, to achieve a, a surface finish of between three and five RA and nearly a mirror finish, because what we want to do is make sure that we have the densest, uh, most concentric, uh, best polished surface to laser engrave into so that we get uh, the best engraving quality and consistency all the way across the, the sleeve or the roller. So that's a little bit about the process. Um, we are actually about to move into a, a new facility here in uh, Batavia, Illinois. Pamarco's just moved our, we just moved our lasers from the old facility, which is about two and a half miles away to our new facility. And we're going to be, we're in the process of moving our our polishing and grinding and our spray equipment and then we're going to have an open house as soon as possible and uh, would love to have anybody that's interested to come in for a kind of a walking tour or walking seminar uh, of the new facility so that you can see these processes uh, in person. So when we choose an analox roll there's a few different things that we have to think about. Uh, the most important you know that on the left hand side here are the, the graphics that are being printed. Are we printing big large solid areas? Are we printing small type? Are we printing half tones? Or are we printing a combination of those things? I mean, we really have to think about what kind of ink film thickness that we need on the surface of that analox, which is determined by the cell volume to print the graphics properly. Another big impact, another big thing to consider, it has a large impact is the, the substrate. How porous is that substrate? Is it an uncoated paper, coated paper, film, foil? Um, does the ink dive into the surface of that substrate or does the ink sit up, sit up on top of the surface of the substrate? Obviously, the more porous it is, the more volume we need in the analox roll to achieve the proper ink film thickness on the surface of the substrate once the, uh, the ink is transferred. Another consideration is the strength of the ink system. Is the ink system formulated for high performance where it's highly pigmented, or are there a lot of fillers, a lot of things in the system to, to decrease the price that don't necessarily improve the performance or improve the, uh, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the pigment load in that ink? So you know, obviously, the better the ink system, the less volume that we need to uh, work with. Ideally, in flexographic printing, you want to use the lowest volume possible to get the proper color and coverage. So a lower volume analox is going to uh, stay cleaner. The plates are going to stay cleaner. The ink is going to dry faster. Uh, so there's a lot of advantages to using a good ink system along with the proper analox volume. And then the last or one of the last things to consider is the cleaning program. How good a job are the press operators doing keeping the analox as clean? whether it be on press or an off press cleaning program. So those are some of the things to think about. When we choose an analox roll, by far the most important thing that we have to, to have to choose or consider is the proper cell volume, which is measured in, in billion cubic microns or BCM. That's 90% of, um, of the importance of that analox is that we have the proper volume to get the proper ink film thickness. Next is cell geometry, and I'll go, go into that a little bit further here with some upcoming slides depth to opening ratio. And then probably the last thing really is the line screen. The line screen does have an impact on how much of that ink transfers out of the cells and how cleanly the, 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 the printing plate will, will, will print, but it's by far um, not as important as a cell volume. Um, again, as I said, the analog volume is most, most critical. The volume is the amount of ink per square inch on the surface of the roller. All right, so we measure that in, in BCM or billion cubic microns. Again, I've said several times, the volume dictates ink film thickness. And generally, depending on the, the variables, depending on the uh, substrate, 
um, ink system, metering system, and so forth, typically somewhere between a 5 and a 9 BCM is utilized to print solids, typically between 3 and 6 BCM to print type, half tones between 1 and 4 BCM, and then the most difficult you know, jobs to print are obviously the, the combination plates or vignettes where you have multiple graphics on the same printing plate and you have to use one analog scroll to, to accomplish those graphics. And that always requires a compromise. So instead of using a 900 line screen 2.2 BCM uh, analogs for the half tones and a you know, 300 line screen 6 BCM or 7 BCM for the solids, we have to use something in between. Um, you know, some, so so you do, it does a pretty good job on the on the half tones and a pretty good job on the solids, but maybe not ideal for either one of them. The next thing is the geometry. You know, for years and years, um, what was utilized in our industry was a, is, was a 60 degree angle. And a 60 degree angle is, um, it, you know, that's the angle that the cells line up next to each other in comparison to the zero axis of the surface of that of that analogs roll. And it's it's a six sided cell where, where all cell walls are meant to be equal in length. And we're basically trying to achieve a, a hexagon or with with circles on the surface of the analogs. And that works excellent. We still recommend that for um, really all process, most all process printing applications where you're trying to put down the, the and control the finest film of ink possible. Uh, 30 degree channel is a compressed six sided cell with a vertical channel. What we are able to do is create a vertical channel running directly around the surface of the analogs by leaving the power of the laser on slightly as we go from one cell to another. And what that does is it, um, it does a better job of allowing that ink to flow from cell to cell and it and wet out a little bit more effectively on the on the substrate. So where we typically will recommend the use of a 30 degree channel is 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 white ink applications on film um, and also high speed presses uh, where in, in, in UV presses where there tends to be a problem with uh, misting or what we what we call spitting. Um, as that analog passes across the doctor blade, the ink isn't contained within the cells like it would be in a 60 degree angle, and it tends not to want to, what I call, pop out of the cells and create that mist. Um, E-flow is a 75 degree angle cell, so the cells line up at a 75 degree angle uh, in comparison to the zero axis. And what it is, it's an elongated cell where the vertical walls are twice as long as the horizontal walls. Um, so what, what we do is we're, stre we're stretching that cell, and it, the benefit of that is, is Typically, when people are printing on, on paper, uh, printing solids, and printing combination plates that have a fairly low line screen, what it does is it, it fills with ink more effectively than a standard 60 degree, and it transfers ink more effectively. The other benefit to it is because we can now elongate the cells, we can increase our line screen horizontally across the surface of the analogs roll by between 30 and 50% without changing the volume. So if you're going from a 60 degree to an E-flow, normally what we would do is, as I mentioned, if we're say we're gonna, we start out at a 400 line screen, 60 degree engraving with a 4.5 BCM, we would keep the 4.5 BCM, but because we measure line screen horizontally across the surface of the roller, we would increase that line screen by, by 30 to 50%. So anywhere somewhere between a 550 and a 600 line screen would be the, the, the line screen that we would use for the e-flow. So it's, a, it's an excellent engraving uh, to reduce ghosting for you know, covering porous substrates and, and printing solids effectively. Depth to opening ratio, this is the best way I can kind of show it is, um, you know, we typically, um, we want to make sure that the depth of the cell is no more than 40% of the width of the opening. So if the opening of your cell is 100 microns wide, your depth would not be more than 40 microns deep. We can go deeper than that. We've engraved, uh, engraved cells with 70% depth to opening ratios. But what you tend to get is a cup or you know a cup instead of a bowl. So what, what, what happens is that 
a good majority of that ink stays in the bottom of the cell and doesn't transfer to the printing plate and doesn't re-wet, so it tends to plug up quicker, um, which, which, you know, it causes poor ink transfer, can cause ghosting issues, um, and also premature wear because as we try to go deeper and deeper with that laser, the top of the cell walls become more undulating and um, channeled, and that channeling creates cell walls that are, are weak and more prone to breaking down and wearing and, and uh, shortening the life of that analogs. Um, typically, you know, the ideal in our opinion or my opinion would be the depth being about a third of the width of the opening. So about a 33% depth opening ratio is, is, is what's typically recommended. Um, next thing is the, the line screen. Everybody's familiar with line screen. The line screen is the number of cells per linear inch, not per square inch, but it's the number of cells per linear inch around the surface of the roller. Um, on, in a 60 and 30 degree engraving, it's the number of cells at either that 60 or that 30 degree angle. As I mentioned before, the 75 degree or E-flow, it's the number of cells horizontally across the roller. So in an e-flow engraving, if we choose a 400 line screen, that means we have 400 cell walls per linear inch uh, horizontally across, but only half of that vertically around, 200 cells per linear inch. So to, to figure out the number of cells per square inch, what you have to do is multiply the horizontal line screen by the vertical line screen. So if we start with a 60 degree angle and that's and we, we, um, we utilize a 400 line screen engraving, 400 times 400 is 160,000 cells per square inch. On an e-flow, because it's it's the line screen is half vertically around as it is horizontal, it'd be 400 times 200, which is I believe 80,000 cells per square inch. And that's why we have to increase the line screen when we go from a 60 degree to an e-flow engraving or why we can increase the line screen. Um, this is some old pictures here that I've had, but I think it does a really good job of illustrating at the same magnification the difference in, in cell sizes of a 200 line screen, a 360, a 400, and a 600. So the, the white parts on the top are the cell walls that support both the doctor blade and the printing plate. Um, so you can see as we go up in line screen, in order for us to keep that 33 to 40% depth to opening ratio, we have to decrease the, the depth of the cell, which decreases the, the volume. The other thing that happens is that you have now more cell walls supporting the printing plate. So not only do you have less ink transferring out of the cell, but you also have more support for that plate. So it's less likely that the edge of the plate is, gonna, is going to be over inked, which can cause dirty print. One of the best ways that you can um, uh, choose an engraving, particularly if you have a, some, you know, new customers, a new press, new, new, new application of any kind, is what we call banded analogs testing, where we have the ability on one analogs roll to put multiple engravings across the surface. You know, we've done as many as I think 15 engravings across the surface of the, of the roller. And typically what a customer will do is, as you can see on the graphics here, is use the same art or the same printing plate for each one of those lanes. So it enables our customers to see what a 400 line, 500 line, 600 line, how an e-flow works, how a 30 degree works, all on one analogs roll so they can choose the proper engraving specification for the graphics that they're looking to print and the substrates they're looking to print. So it's an extremely valuable tool it's different than doing a fingerprint or a press characterization. A fingerprint or a press character characterization is done after running the banded analogs test. The banded analogs test tells us what engravings should work best based upon the variables that the printer is, is faced with. And then once those engravings are chosen, then we make a set of four or seven um, engravings that then can be used to uh, characterize that press or do a fingerprint of the press to see what it's capable of doing. So they're they're a little different from one another, but a banded analogs is a great tool. We typically recommend if somebody buys an analogs, keep it, you know, buys a banded analogs roll to keep it because you may need it in the future and there may be some benefit to having that available for future testing. 
Um, so this, this is uh, this is a, a, kind of the new thing that I wanted to talk about in this in this uh, seminar or webinar is a recent test that we did with one of our large customers. One of our large customers uh, was having having some issues with with uh, too many press down times, too many too many pulls or too many uh, adjustments on the press because they were having problems getting the proper ink strength. Um, and what we did is we took an analog, so this was off a of WH Vistaflex press, and we engraved the entire roller with one of their most common engraving specifications, which is 550 line screen, 5.5 BCM, 60 degree engraving. And then what we did is we polished that roller to simulate wear from a doctor blade. So what we did is we used a, um, our, our, our diamond embedded film polisher to polish bands. We polished one band down to a 4.95 BCM or 88% of the original volume. We polished another band down to 4.4 BCM, another one to 3.85, 3.3, and 2.75 BCM. So we had everywhere from 100% of the original volume down to 55% of the original volume. And what they did is they printed six different colors. They printed uh, Reflex Blue, Pantone 2602 Purple, 146 Brown, 207 red, 3295 green, and then also opaque white. And this is an example of one of the colors. This is the green. And you can see at the very top left, you know, the, the, the band, 100% band, or is actually 98%. It was just slightly lower than the 5.5 volume. And as we go crisscross across it, you can see down in the bottom right, um, is the, the lane that was at 55% of the original volume. So when you look at the results, uh, we measured delta E. The delta E is the measurement of color taken into consideration strength, color hue or shade, cleanliness of the color. So it's really the, the, the measurement that's used by our customers and our customers' customers to make sure that the color that our, that our customers are matching um, stay consistent and match the proof that their customer has approved. So typically most customers want to stay within a 2.0 Delta E. And what we found was for the most part at the 100%, the 5.5, the ink was a little strong and compared to the, the proof. And so the Delta E was actually a little bit a little bit um, more off compared to the 4.85 BCM, because as we got down to 4.585 BCM, uh, the ink wasn't quite as strong, but you can see what happened as we go down to 4.4, 3.85, 3.3, and 2.75. So that's an average of all of those five colors. Uh, so on average, once we, once we hit 15% or more wear, or 85% of the original volume, the Delta E swung to the point where it was beyond 2.0 or beyond the acceptable range. For white opacity, these are the numbers. Uh, don't really, for this test, I'm not really sure what the standard was, but you can see the opacity numbers. There doesn't tend to be as big of a swing in opacity as we decrease cell volume. But, um, but we did see a, obviously a, a decrease in white opacity readings. Why is it important or what is the cost of the wrong analogs or an analog that's worn out or plugged up? You know, really how often is the press down due to color matching, ink strengthening, or score lines? So why is it important that you maintain and monitor the condition of your analogs rolls? You know, what's press time worth? You know, it varies, I'm sure, with, with, with print, from printer to printer. But if you look at, um, you know, press time is worth $500 an hour and you're averaging three ink adjustments per job based upon having the wrong analogs or, you know, a dirty analogs, a worn analogs or analogs with score lines. And each one of those adjustments is 30 minutes and you average 50 jobs per month. That's $450,000 of downtime per press per year because we have 
the wrong analogs or the customer doesn't know what analogs role that they have and we're not able to duplicate what was achieved previously. So that's that's for this particular customer, they were actually averaging about five, um, five, five adjustments per press and they were averaging 100 jobs per month and they have, I believe, six presses there. So that's a, a quite a quite a bit of money. So it really it really pays for itself. Analogs management pays for itself, you know, tenfold. There's a lot of ways you can do it. Um, there's 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 several different pieces of instrumentation. You can uh, the top left is what a lot of our customers utilize, which is the Anicam system made by a company called Troika, where they can do a self measurement of the the analog cells and analog volume. The middle, top middle is the microdynamic scope, which some customers utilize and a lot of analog suppliers utilize as their standard process. Uh, bottom left is a kind of a liquid volume test. And the liquid volume test uh, allows for a quick check of volume. It doesn't necessarily tell you if the roll is worn or dirty, but it will tell you where your volume is. And then, you know, the other thing we can do for you or you can do and, and send to us is a microfax, as you can see on the top, and people call it a foil test. Really what it is, it's a polymer material that's backed with a metallized coating that allows us to take a mold of the surface of that analogs roll and then analyze it with our microscopes. So we, again, as I mentioned, we um, utilize, and most of our competitors utilize the microdynamic scope because of its capabilities. It's, it has some additional capabilities that, that uh, in my, again, in my opinion, that the Anticam doesn't have. One of the things it allows us to do, you can see on the bottom left, is do a side-by-side -side comparison between the engraving when it was new or an engraving that was, was produced a year or two years ago and gives us analytical data as to the, the current engraving as it is now versus when it was brand new. The other thing we can do is do a 2D profile so we can measure the amount of channeling on the cell walls. We can do a 3D profile. We can look at the cells inverted, and that's a good way to determine if they're plugged or not, or how consistent the cell depth is across the surface of the roller. So, you know, most, most reputable analog suppliers can provide this service for our customers if our customers don't have the ability to, to do it themselves. Um, so it's just, it just requires a, a, fair, a clean roll, clean spot on the roller, and then the use of the impressions or the microfaxes, and that can be analyzed uh, within, within our lab. And these are just some results of some you know, testing that we did or a, a, of, of the report that we brought back to our customers. Um, the top left one is a 360 line screen, original volume of 6 BCM. Uh, currently, it's at 5.93, so 98.8% of its original volume. So it's pretty much in brand new condition. Bottom right uh, is a 500 line screen, and I covered up the volume, but currently um, it's at 64.4%. And you can see by looking at the cell walls, you know, the amount of wear that's taken place. So what we look at when we, um, when we, when we measure the uh, wear, is the wall to opening ratio. How wide is that wall compared to the width of the opening? Generally, when a roll is new, it's about 5%. As it starts to wear, the wall becomes wider, the opening narrower, the depth shallower, and our volume decreases. The um, thing that we look at in terms of uh, plugging, and we don't re I really don't have a good picture here on that, is the depth to opening ratio. So as a, as a cell plugs up, the depth de decreases, but the opening doesn't change. So instead of having a you know, 33% depth opening ratio, we may be at 20% and the volume can be significantly decreased because of that. All right, and then, so those are the two things we look at as, as well as the effective cell volume and the, the photograph that tells us, you know, gives us um, optical information to help us determine what the issue is if there is an issue. So what are we looking for when we do our audits? Again, where the walls get wider, shallower. And again, we recommend for, at least for wide web applications, maintaining an 85% plus, uh, 
plus effective volume. Um, you know, once you once you wear 15% off the original volume, it's time to really start evaluating whether or not that role needs to be reconditioned. Plugging, you know, so a, pl a plugged role can happen in a day. You know, it can simulate or 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 give you the similar results to a worn out role, but happen, like I say, in a day or a couple hours versus, uh, you know, versus a, a worn roller. That's why we try to find a clean spot on the surface of the roller when we do our inspection because it can give us false readings. Yeah, score lines big, has been a big problem over the years um, in our in our industry. Basically, little particles of ceramic that have been broken off either by typically by debris that's in the ink that gets trapped between the doctor blade and the surface of the analox roll that can leave these shiny little lines on the surface. And we look at it, you know, two different ways. There's there's score lines and there's scratch lines. A score line is typically a wider, a wide uh, row of wear, typically eight, 10, 12 cells wide, where you can pretty much uh, um, guarantee that there was a contaminant that got trapped in the system and created that wear on the surface of the analox. A scratch line, or like you see on the top left hand side, where you have thousands of little tiny scratches all the way across the surface. That's generally from one of two things, either either too much doctor blade impression or running it, running the doctor blade dry or the surface of that analogs as manufactured being channeled and not as smooth as it should be. And what happens is that these little nodules will break off when the cell is formed where the where the walls meet and we have a corner, it sticks up like a little crown where the corners stick up and those little corners tend to be hard and brittle and can break off and create these little scratch lines and even you know create create score lines so what we do and most of our competitors do i've got my slides out of line here but one, one of the things we recommend again is magnetic filters to filter out any you know metal from the doctor blades um, anything that's metallic in the system or any chunks of, of ink we have both a magnet and a and a uh, strainer or filter but one of the things that we feel is very important is doing what we call post polishing. So what we do is we engrave the cell volume to approximately 15% higher than the customer specification so that we can use the, the film polisher, as you can see up on the top left hand side and polish the surface of the roll with a fine diamond particle. We use three, six or nine micron particles embedded uh, particles of diamond embedded into a film with a lubricating oil that allows us to polish that surface back to remove those high points and create a flat kind of pre-broken in surface that will be more resistant to the scratching scoring and wear all right so the last last part is is analox cleaning so i mean again you can wearing an analox takes time typically Score lines don't necessarily take time. That can happen. The, 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 a score line is more susceptible to happen when the roll is brand new because that's when the surface is the least smooth. You know, over time, that doctor blade creates a smoother, worn surface. Um, so a score line can happen. If it does happen, it typically is going to happen fairly quickly, uh, unfortunately. But uh, wear takes time. Uh, cleaning is important to make sure that we keep that volume consistent. And the ideal time to clean the analox is while that ink is still wet, while the analox is in the press. Um, in my opinion, the off press cleaning processes, which are great, we sell them, uh, should be a supplement to good on press cleaning procedures. And what's good on press cleaning procedures? It really depends on the printer, but again, getting flushing, typically what we would recommend is draining the ink out of the system, running solvent or water-based um, cleaning solution through the press and then utilizing we recommend these microfiber pads at the bottom to scrub the surface while the ink is still wet to flush the ink out of the cells there are also automated systems that use brushes and or these microfiber pads but as far as off press cleaning um, you know over the years it's gone you, 30 years ago, the ultrasonic cleaning systems were developed. Uh, 25, maybe closer to 30 years ago now, the baking soda cleaning processes 
uh, were, were developed. Uh, typically today, ultrasonic is primarily used for narrow web applications. Baking soda, primarily used for corrugated applications. MicroClean, which I don't have a picture here of the MicroClean, but that's similar to the baking soda. Uh, it utilizes a plastic beads versus sodium bicarbonate. What happens is it's both the baking soda and the MicroClean system works with uh, either baking, the baking soda or plastic beads sprayed under pressure against the surface of the analogs. When it hits the analogs, it shatters. The, the beads shatter, not the analogs, but the, uh, the beads shatter and break into smaller pieces, and that scrubs the ink or the coating from inside the cells. Then the flexo wash system, which I call the car wash for, uh, for analox rolls, we drizzle on a, a chemical solution on the surface, let it sit for a while, and then power wash it. Um, you know, that's, that's a process that's been pretty popular over the last 10 years or more. Uh, and then today, what we're seeing is more and more of the lasers that are utilized at very low wattage. I mean, we use analox, lasers to engrave analox rolls at 200 or 500 watts of power, the lasers that are used to clean um, or to, you know, to clean the analogs is generally are used in the, the, the 10 to 14 watt uh, range. So the idea is that it ablates or, or burns, vaporizes the ink without damaging the surface of the, of the roll. Um, so that's it. Let me get out of the thing here. So there, let me see if there's any, any questions, no questions? There, oh, are, a there questions. are a couple questions. Okay, so we have, we got two, two questions. Um, First one is typically how long does it take for an analox roll to wear from a five and a half BCM to a 2.75 BCM? That's a good question. You know, just like with the variables in the in the in the printing process, there's a lot of variables in how an analox roll wears. You know, again, blade pressure, the type of ink that's being used, and and all different types of things. But I would say, on average, with a steel doctor blade, um, we're, we're probably looking at about three or four, three to four years. In that in that range, so it depends on how often that roll is used in the press, and all the other variables involved with it. And then another uh, another question is: Can eFlow be used to improve ink coverage, while at the same time avoid plugging? That's exactly what it's really meant to do. Because what happens is um, we we by by increasing the line screen horizontally across the surface of the analogs. What we're doing is we're increasing the number of little strings of ink that transfer from the surface of the analogs to the printing plate. You know, little striations of ink as it as ink splits from the surface to the plate. Um, what so as we go up in line screen, it'll help that those little striations to flow together and create a, a good solid coverage, reduces pinholing, reduces a mod, you know, the modeled appearance that you can get. But then at the same time, because it is elongated and the bottom is shallower at the at, at the same volume as a 60 degree engraving, um, it will tend to transfer and refill more efficiently. And that's why it, you, know, you tend to get more consistent ink density over a long run or a long period of time. And it also reduces ghosting problems. So those are, let's see, is there another one here? Oh yeah, there is. Um, what are your thoughts on enzyme based cleaners? I don't have any, unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not familiar with that. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, but, uh, be f feel free to contact me. I mean, if there's with, with an MS, you know, SDS and I'd be happy to take a look at it, but I'm not really familiar with, with the, uh, enzyme based cleaners. Apologize for that. What would you consider the maximum percentage volume loss before I need to re-engrave? I'd say 15 to 20% typically. So it really depends on the color, the, um, you know, the, the quality expectation. You know, if you're measuring Delta E, uh, or, or if you're not, then, then obviously you may be able to get away with a larger percentage of loss. Another question here is how many times can I re-engrave a sleeve before it needs to be replaced? 
it really depends again how that sleeve was handled. Uh, what tends to happen with with an analog sleeve is when they go bad, they generally go bad from the inside and from the inside, meaning the compressible layer that is between the fiberglass inner layer and the composite material um, tends to break down with over time and and uh, more so with liquids penetrating into that compressible layer. Uh, today, what we do instead of using aluminum end rings, for the most part, we're using a hard epoxy material on the, the outside edge of the sleeve to protect that compressible layer and the fiberglass layer and um, uh, you know to keep that from breaking down as quickly. But I would say on average, I would say five to ten times would be probably the average. What we do as a company when we process a sleeve is we will mount it on a, a, a processing mandrel that we have and then we put it in a what we call a strip grinder. So we grind the ceramic off down till we get to the corrosion barrier. And then after that, we will grip blast off the corrosion barrier down to the aluminum base. So we try to minimize the amount of ceramic and, and uh, corrosion barrier that we remove. So we're, we're not putting in a lathe and not cutting the aluminum down, which requires a buildup. And as the more you do that, if you're cutting that aluminum down and you're building it up every time, you, you create a thinner and thinner aluminum shell or aluminum wall and once it gets to a you know to a certain point we can no longer spray it and it tends to the outside the shell tends to become out of round so as long as we have a good outside aluminum shell typically about 200 thousandths or 250 thousandths thick um, we should be able to reprocess that as long as the compressible layer doesn't break down numerous times but i would say five to ten would be would be the average uh, another question is how would I run a banded roller and who should or would be involved? Is this something my plate, plate maker would lead? Yeah, it should be a, um, you know, we, we just finished one, finished a few of them not too long ago. Generally, what we'd recommend is that you, the plate maker, the uh, uh, ink company, and your analog supplier all get involved. And I would start by contacting all of them and having them get together with you and discuss what you're looking to to accomplish. We did one recently where we ran every substrate that the customer was running and um, you know we tested a lot of different things. So it's a great tool and we're, we're still kind of working working through all that, but they wanted to uh, take a fresh new start and I would definitely get as many people involved as you possibly can, but I would definitely take your recommendation as far as engravings from the analog supplier. They're they're the expert on the analogs engravings, not to say that plate makers and ink ink makers or ink, ink people don't have an opinion on the analogs, but I would definitely take let the, your analog supplier take the lead as to what they would recommend. Um, another one for corrugated applications. How do you determine how do you determine the correct analog specs if your mix is some process and full coverage? Well, it's very difficult in corrugated applications because you don't typically, unless you, you have a newer press where you can change your analogs, you, you, you pretty much have to stay with that one analog that you have in the print station. And it's a it's really a big compromise. I mean, that's really the, the ultimate in terms of uh, compromising. You know, so you really what you have to look at is, you know, the substrates that you utilize, the graphics that you print, I think what we've seen is that there's, there's a lot of customers that do not have the ability to change their analogs and, and want to run on multiple substrates that try to achieve too much in terms of line screen on their printing plates. You know, in my opinion, in those applications, the best thing you can do is try to minimize the line screen on your plate as much as you possibly can, which will give you the ability to print those half tones. Um, you know, more more cleanly and more effectively while being able to print solids. But again, that's that's another area where a banded analogs um, is helpful, but also we find the eFlow engravings helpful. And quite honestly, I mean, if you were to show some samples of what you want to print on the substrates that you want to print on to, you know, our technical sales reps, we should be able to really guide you in the right direction as to what engraving would work best for you know for the wide range of applications that you want to uh, to accomplish 
Uh, I have a few jobs that I need to run slow due to bounce. Any thoughts on what I should look at to fix or reduce the issue? Um, well, generally, I guess it depends on it depends on the uh, it, it you know really depends on what kind of application that is. I mean, what kind of press it is and so forth. But uh, one of the things that you can look at is is potentially maybe depends on whether it's a sleeve or if it's a, uh, a roller. Um, you know, carbon fiber may be uh, may be helpful from an analog standpoint. Um, you know, from an analog standpoint, there's not a ton that we can do to to reduce the bounce other than trying to make that roll stiffer. Uh, but feel free to reach out to me and I'd be able to, you know, to talk about this in more specifics and I'll see if I have some better answers for you because without knowing the exact application, it, it's hard for me to make recommendations, but I would be more than happy to do that whether it be from an analog standpoint or maybe looking at some things differently in terms of your um, print sleeves, impression cylinders, that type of thing. Another one here, last one so far, I think. At high speeds and on wide machines, can deflection of the roll inhibit issues with laying down ink? It definitely can. Yeah, it can definitely, it definitely create some issues, can, can create issues. Um, you know, particularly the high speeds, the ink doesn't want to transfer. It's a little different from the old days. The old days when we were utilizing rubber roll metering systems, you know, the faster you ran, the more the ink wanted to transfer out of the cell because you weren't wiping the surface of the analogs cleanly and you transfer more color. You know, today utilizing uh, doctor blade systems, fine screen engravings and the, the speeds that, that are being run at, the ink does not want to transfer as effectively. And, um, you know, deflection can create not only print problems, um, but also tr ink transfer problems because now it, it, you, it's the, the bounce or the deflection can create impression issues. So, you know, again, from an analog standpoint, it depends on the graphics. Uh, there are, you know, an e-flow engraving or a 30 degree channel engraving may help if you're having ink lay down problems from on solids. Um, but, you know, a lot of it uh, just is, is really mechanical and machine, um, you know, or that's it. Yep. Well, thank you for the questions. Feel free to uh, to reach out to me um, for those that had some questions that I wasn't able to answer maybe as effectively as I'd like to. If you can get me some more details, I'll do everything I can to uh, to see if I can uh, get you some, some better answers and some more information. Have a great day.